so welcome everybody to another podcast, the Sustainable Success Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to be with Jeff Casebo. Jeff is with uh, Dynavec, a company that manufactures one of my favorite exercise machines here in the facility, the Gluteator. And I'm sure before we're done, we'll talk about that at length. But I wanted to start off by just asking Jeff to tell listeners about his background and, and where he comes to where he's doing today, what he's done in the past. So, folks, Jeff Casebolt. Usually when I'm asked this question, I can always kind of go back to the beginning because I think the journey is the most interesting part. Um, my journey starts with an ACL uh, reconstruction surgery or tear initially and then a reconstruction surgery. And for me, it's when I found out that uh, it was a high school strength staff that probably shouldn't have been doing what they were doing. Subsequently, there were several of us in my generation, my era that uh, tore ACLs and went through the process of rehabilitation and, and trying to understand why me and all those things that happen with injured athletes. And it what the process, what really happened was I, I, I could no longer identify with being an athlete. I don't think I cognizantly thought this way back then, but I looking back in hindsight, I, I had lost my identity and I was kind of floundering about and I realized that athletics were not really an option for me any longer and I kind of had to redefine myself. So in many ways, I was trying to turn a positive, you know, something into a positive from a negative. And I I found this building on, on a college campus, it's called the library and there's these articles and you start reading. And so my thirst for understanding why I was injured to, you know, trying to redefine myself at the exact same time kind of was a perfect storm, if you will. And, and I, I won't tell you that I was immediately successful in that transformation, but it, it definitely set me in a different, a different path. And as a, you know, as a result, I just started reading, started questioning. I pulled myself out of therapy. I put myself in therapy. At the time, the debate was closed and open kinetic kinetic chain exercises, looking at joint loads, looking at, you know, connective tissue, muscular effort. And consequently, what ended up happening is I really developed a clinical view of how to properly strength train somebody at a very, very early age in my career. So I was not even in my 20s yet. And I'm already looking at injury potentials, muscle balancing, um, a lot of the stuff that really doesn't come in to, to, to play for most trainers until much later, or they've been, they've run up against a client or two that have challenged them. So for me, I was my own first client. I had to figure out first, why was I injured? So long story short, I was started my undergrad, immediately finished, jumped into my master's. Um, A lot of that had to do with, because I didn't know what the heck I was going to do with my life. Started personal training. What were you studying specifically? I was a I was at the time, it's a joke that I make all the time. I was a PE major when I started and I just called myself a big dumb jock is what I called myself. And then somewhere in that process, uh, the university that I was at um, switched from calling it physical education to to kinesiology because it just sounds smarter. So my degree got upgraded and I make that joke all the time. And then I stayed. Um, where I felt safe and I did my master's um, under some really good progressive um, professors that were more into, you know, critical analysis and experiential learning and just not the, not the cookie cutter multiple choice, but like really get your hands dirty. We, we worked in, you know, I remember being at Sac State and doing, um, Paralympics, working with Paralympic athletes, and and it changes your mindset. You know, you're not working with, you're working with somebody that's that it has a limitation, and you got to figure out how to work around that that limitation so they get the most out of their training. It just changes your whole perspective, and that was, you know, you figure I 
I was 22, 23 years old when I had that opportunity, that experience. It just changed the way I, I did things. And then from there, um, finished up, wrote my master's thesis, got some interest, uh, had some friends do a PhD and started looking like, I, I could do that. I, you know, I, I could probably pull that off. And I started looking at what I really interested in and so I chose biomechanics and, and I went to do a PhD in biomechanics and um, while there, uh, while working, um, my professor that I was working for walked into the lab one day and said, hey, I need you to sit in on this meeting. And that's when I met Kent Folks for the first time. And Kent had this idea of what is now called the gluteator. And we listened to Kent journey we listened to a story we we had a, an, an in-depth conversation with him and he left Kent left and, and and my boss basically said I he didn't want anything to do with it nor did he have the time to work with a piece of equipment I said man there's there's something there I just don't know exactly what it is yet but I, I just I just had this like drawing to do it and as a result, um, he, he gave me permission to work on it on my own time. Um, we had some lab projects going on that took precedence, obviously. So I developed the protocol, um, pulled in a master's student and um, one of my research colleagues for, it usually takes a three-man crew to run a biomechanics lab. And we... we so, so at that time, the work you're referring to, you were teaching kinesiology? I was a... I was a I was a PhD candidate teaching kinesiology, biomechanics. Um, I was doing a lecture and lab at different semesters. I mean, it was kind of all, I can't even tell you what semester I was doing what, but I know that I was primarily teaching kinesiology, biomechanics, either lecture or lab, depending on what semester and how we divvied everything up. Um, and a lot of that was based off our, our laboratory obligations. And um, so what ended up happening was is in the middle of testing, we, we, we get this, this new piece of equipment, we get it in there, we bring in a squat rack, we bring in a, 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 a traditional abduction machine. We just wanted to, to run some comparisons. We did some 5RM, five repetition maximum testing. We looked at the different um, planes of motion in terms of a purely frontal, a purely sagittal, and then we start looking at this combination of bringing in resistance from multiple planes or multiple directions. And I remember standing in the lab the day we kind of were running the initial tests, and I can see, I can look down and see the computer screen and I can see the person we have the EMG electrodes hooked up to. We got all the cameras running and everything. And I was like, wow, this thing works. It worked a lot better than I thought it was going to, to be honest with you. And so we finished the data collection. I looked at the numbers and I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't real pleased with the initial data collection. Something just didn't feel right. So I gathered a group of people that I would consider more expert lifters. And I think the initial study had more novice lifters. So I grabbed a handful of expert lifters, what I would consider people who had a, a much more experience um, in and around weight rooms. And we put it to the test. And sure enough, the numbers kind of held, held true, held a little better than we were anticipating. We've never released that data because there was always flaws in, in, in how the data was collected and, and the power numbers were low in the second part of it. So it was never going to be a good piece of research to put out there. But I feel comfortable with the numbers. I, 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 was, I was a test subject a Kate for the case for the original study designs. So I, I know what it felt like to be on both sides of that EMG machine. Um, to Kent's credit, I took the information to him, wrote a little executive summary based on what we had. He it, it was he went to several people. And this is the part where Dynavex journey is really interesting because he went to several professionals and nobody would give him the time of the day. 
because when he initially would go to them, their, their attitude was you couldn't sit on your bottom and strengthen your glutes. That was loosely translated from what was said to him, but that was kind of the idea behind it because at the time squatting was king and, and nothing else seemed to work your glutes according to popular opinion. And I, I can honestly say that I probably wasn't too far removed from that, but I was more progressive in the way that I thought because of my clinical background and trying to get the glutes to fire for, for posture, for function, for amongst elderly, amongst athletes, and knowing that the glutes were a primary muscle in the posterior kinetic chain. And I'm like, if there's another way to do this, I'm all in, let's play with it. And that was probably the difference of how we got started, where he was getting rejected from other opportunities. And so I pitched the, I pitched what I, what I was seeing in the data and I, and I informed Kent and he and I kind of struck up a friendship. And then several years later, you know, it was like, all right, let's make a go with this. And that was probably around 2014. We kind of like initially started kicking the tires about like, let's really get this thing out there because I think there's value. And I'll be honest, when we first started, it wasn't well received. It was not well received at all. And it was um, eye opening. It was very eye opening. I can remember being at the first couple of conferences where we're in the 10 by 10 square, you know, strength trainers in their natural habitat. And people are walking by and trying to avoid eye contact because they want nothing to do with what we're trying to sell and i and i got it i saw it go ahead so kind of a trade show for for people bringing in various pieces of equipment it was my first exposure of being on that side of the trade show mm -hmm. normally i just been kind of a patron of the or a, or a membership or whatever it was i would just i would be on the other side so, so the then people attending, say, the people attending would have been universities colleges sports teams yes. Yes, it was it was fitness experts, strength experts. Um, at the time, I remember there were several popular pieces of equipment that had full size booths there. Um, and, and I don't want to throw anybody under a bus. I'm just kind of telling our journey. But it was my first exposure. I mean, we had I, I I'll always remember this. I had people laughing at what we were trying to present to them. They're just absolutely I had. People explain to us that, that scientifically there's no way this works. Right. Interesting. Yeah, but hold on a second. I understand where you're coming from, but give us a fair shake, you know, and it was so initially it was very frustrating um, because it wasn't like we were, you know, feel the dreams, build it and they will come. It just didn't happen. And so the the first couple of of I want to say years, probably we we struggled with identifying with what we were and who our market was and you know and I've appeared on on like Lawrence's and he and I that was a large section of what we kind of had talked about is like his question I always remember was like wait you build it and you didn't even know who you're yeah that's exactly what happened we kind of fell into this by accident almost because we knew it was a better product but at the same time so then subsequently from there um my curious mind, my passion to understand things, I just started digging into everything in terms of how this machine can contribute and pick your realm of strength training, whether it be for athletes, elderly, clinical, um, powerlifting, weightlifting. I mean, it just, I can talk about it from multiple fronts, but I think that for Kent, my uh, his background he's he's an an arthur jones um was one of his idols mentors not necessarily a mentor but he definitely had some sort of fascination with how arthur was doing things with nautilus and then eventually medex and so i when we would go on our long drives together <laughs> I would hear a lot of Arthur Jones stories and a lot of Arthur Jones theories. And then I got a chance to meet Dan Riley, which worked with Arthur and their history is well documented. And, and Dan wrote a couple of chapters for some books of his. And, but then 
I started doing my own research instead of just accepting Kent's. And then I realized that my, what I thought was fairly extensive knowledge and strength training was actually just a one-sided limited. And I needed to ask better questions. Right. And so it, I'll be honest with you, it, it torqued my brain. It, it wasn't an easy journey because I had to abandon everything I thought I knew and get into this place where I was professionally very vulnerable and ask better questions and willing to let the science or an internal dialogue or, or whatever it is to drive or create my direction um without my bias without my current level of bias and and so that's professionally it's probably the best thing i've ever done and, and but it, it, to be commended um recently i was introduced to a quote i think the gentleman who first said it is upton is the name i don't know if it's george upton i'm probably getting this wrong but it said if your paycheck depends on not understanding me i'm gonna have a hard time making you understand. And so for a lot of people, uh, you know, looking at what they're doing, what they've been teaching, what they've invested in, uh, time, money, and everything else, it's very hard for them to, to put their egos in the background and go, wait a sec, maybe I'm wrong about some of this. So good for you. Well, and I think at the time, there was this concept that kind of kept going back into my brain. And and the idea was conformity versus creativity. And higher education is really about conformity, unfortunately. And, you, we, you know, basically most professors, I learned what I learned. I'm going to teach you what I learned. I'm going to test you based on what I've learned. And I'm going to grade you based on what I've learned. Where if we really want to make a difference in education or higher, specifically more higher education, I believe there has to be some level of creativity that is infused. Now, easy for me to say, very difficult to execute, it, right. given the current state of the education system and where we're at, but it's real easy to make that, that claim or that statement and and but I just think if if somebody all of a sudden said, you know what, Jeff, here, go sit in and make those necessary changes, man, that would be I don't it would be difficult. It'd be very, very difficult. Identifying the problem is easier than implementing the solution. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I agree. And so so what in so, you know, that's but going through that process of reevaluating what I knew, I found something called the, Dun the Dunning-Kruger effect. And I love it because it makes so much sense to me having gone through the process. And, you know, there's a place in the, in the graph that is, there's a big learning curve up and it's kind of what you know over time. And it, it's referred to as the mound of stupidity. And in order to truly become an ex a quote-unquote expert or somebody that has a large amount of knowledge on a particular topic you have to go through this place of vulnerability where you have to question everything and, and challenge everything you think you know and then every time you do it you realize you know you don't know nearly as much as you thought you did and I didn't I didn't know that's what I was doing when I started the journey but once I got on the other side I was like oh, crap, it makes more sense now what I just did. And yeah, it was it was painful and it wasn't easy. And, and professionally, I seriously questioned everything I was doing. But I got to a place where I'm like, all right, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. Let's figure this out. We can do it. You know, and there's not, and I tell people all the time, I've made more mistakes than, than I care to count. But you know, there's a quote out there, I'm either winning or I'm learning, and I don't really want to get that smart. So that's a joke. But So so it's uh, the quote that's often attributed to Bruce Lee is, if you come to me with a full cup, then I can't teach you anything. You have to empty your cup first, right? And Stephen Covey said, all great breakthroughs are first break with, right? They are breaking with the, the orthodox uh, knowledge, in many cases, the established 
sort of thing, and it takes a while for that to change. I wish um, Bruce Lee has a tremendous amount, and I've only ever seen one book uh, tr attributed to his authorship in terms of, I think he had somebody write it with him, but he's got some, his journey is tremendous. And, and if you are quoting Bruce Lee, then I know you've really had to dive in and, and find those because they're not always readily available, but they're incredibly impactful if you understand. And I like his because a lot of his stuff is about the physical journey as well. And I think that fits more in line with kind of what we're doing for a living in terms of working with the physical side of, of everything. Um, but yeah, and then current day, I end up uh, teaching for several years. I worked in forensics and then I went into teaching. And then ultimately, um, January of this year, I stepped away from the university and now I'm Dynavec full time um, with intent of, yes, I'm trying to sell fitness equipment, but I'm also trying to get people to understand kind of the bigger picture and my platform is more along the lines of clinical medicinal strength development and try to break some of the molds or stereotypes of what are currently out there um, in, in the general public or in general population. Um, I feel like it's, it is widely known. We've never we've never not known more than we do right now. And yet less and less people are active participants. So, I mean, I'm, I, I've got questions. I mean, what's going on? And so uh, Dynavex afforded me the opportunity to really pursue my passion where in the education system, teaching at a university, it simply wasn't available because of the time constraints of, of either writing research, producing research, teaching classes, preparing for classes. I was never able to really explore my what I believe is my true passion. And so that's where I'm at right now is um, I'm writing a lot more. Um, um, published a lot more since I've walked away. I've actually worked with some former students and done some stuff where we're contributing. Um, and so it's been, it's only been about 10 months since I walked away, but I've been as busy, but more productive, if that makes sense. So just to back up a little bit for yes, sir. Lis listeners who are, he are hearing us refer to a gluteator. And so you and I, of course, know uh, it's an exercise equipment. So could you describe briefly the Dyn Dynavec gluteator is an exercise machine that does what? So once again, I kind of like the, I like the journey and it goes back to Arthur Jones. And if you read his bulletins on arthurjonesexercise.com, pick up the bulletins and start kind of running through them. You'll learn a lot about his approach, but as I've stated, Kent was a big fan of Arthur Jones and Arthur Jones says in chapter two of the first bulletin, um, you know, if, if he talks about biarticular resistance, he talks about resistance in more than one plane simultaneously. He he mentions all this stuff in 1970, early 70s is from what I have been told. That's when the bulletins were actually penned. And so flash forward several years, Kent had developed a method for creating resistance in more than one plane simultaneously. And the fun part of that is it, the story goes is that he literally was looking at a, an anatomy book and realized the gluteus maximus fibers were approximated at a 45 degree angle. Well, math tells us that if we create two points of resistance, the line of resistance is going to be along that 45 degree angle. And so he started flirting with the idea of adding... Um, these two points of resistance in and simultaneously to see if he could get the glute maximus to fire more efficiently. And that's how it started. That's what that's how the gluteator started. So when you look at the gluteator, there's a point of resistance to the knee and the bottom of the foot. So you're working in sagittal 
extension and frontal, which is abduction, the combination of the two is isolated to the gluteus maximus. And then as you go through the full range of motion, you'll notice the high glute max and then medius and minimus, depending on the person and leg length, that'll start to fire as well. Um, the way that I explain it to people is the gluteus, um, the dynavec gluteators to your glute maximus as a leg extension machine is to your quadriceps. It has that same exact kind of muscle pump fatigue that you, that you experience on a really aggressive set of leg extension, but it's isolated to your backside. So you will kind of John Wayne a little bit when you walk away from a gluteator, you'll have a little bit of a funny gait if done properly. Right. That explain? Yeah, yeah. So when is there, when somebody's using it, should they emphasize more the pressure in the bottom of the foot or the outer thighs, or is it kind of try to do both? Um, the progression for me, when I teach somebody, the progression that I take people through is as human beings, we are more efficient at moving in sagittal plane. Most of our movements are sagittally plane oriented. So I've had more success getting someone to, to push with the bottom of their feet initially. And then I usually stand or kneel to the side of the machine and then what I'll do is I'll have them, the, the victim or the, the client push through and bring the weight, all the, the leg levers all the way to the bottom. I'll hold it there and then make sure they got it and then control it with just the bottom of their feet back up and they will feel their glutes contract. And then after I feel like they've got a tempo or a rhythm to the movement, then I'll hold it at the bottom of the movement again, and then I'll have them push out forcefully with the knees, not really emphasizing the bottom of the feet. And then I'll have them control it eccentrically again, which is more the mechanical load on the tissue. And then after they develop um, a movement pattern with just that, then I try to put it all together. So it's kind of whole part, whole teaching. Right. And the reason behind that is because it, the re there's a reason when we're looking for an address on a street we don't know, we turn the radio down. We're only able to process so much at a time when we're learning. And so I try to simplify each of the steps and then bring it all together, like rub the belly and pat the head. And I've had fairly good success. I've had other people explain how they do it. It works for them. And there's, there's more than one way to do that. But ultimately, what I really want somebody to be able to do is push down with the feet and out with the knees simultaneously. Sure. If, if that happens, especially if you can get them to hold the isometric contraction at the bottom, pin the leg levers against the stopper and hold it there and then really emphasize that eccentric load. I mean, it's a royal pain in the bottom if done properly. And that's what I believe. Is that fair? Yeah. So now what are the benefits of having strong gluteus in athletics and elderly people uh where how, how important is that particular muscle to have strong um devil's advocate if it's weak you will see dysfunction as far away as your elbow and as far away as, the, as your feet interacting with the ground if your glutes are weak Specifically, if you have unilateral weakness, if you have weakness on one side, you'll see you'll see movement patterns um, impaired in transverse plane. You'll see some rotational movements through as close as the hips. You'll also see where the foot comes down in contact with the ground, one side versus the other. When you've had uh, glute weakness impaired, like or glute weakness or or dysfunctional glute firing patterns. Now, the whole like glute amnesia and all that stuff that gets mentioned, it's it's not like your glutes aren't firing. It's just that they start either not firing when they're supposed to protect the body from itself or there's some level of dysfunction in their firing pattern or there's generalized weakness, which is preventing them from the glutes from producing a high rate of firing, if that makes sense. Right. And so. And so um, 
I just read an article the other day from somebody who fancies himself a pitching coach at a very high level. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying that that's 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 where they're at. And if you go from glutes through the lumbar sacral, latissimus, shoulder, shoulder dysfunction leads to elbow mechanic issues. And that's how you'll see elbow issues. That pitcher may be experiencing elbow issues, but in actuality, they're not using their glutes properly and they're having to set their arm differently because they're not accelerating or decelerating or stabilizing their pelvis. And that dysfunction is going up the kinetic chain or upstream, if you will. Um, the other direction, if you see, um, like something as simple as an ankle sprain, what you'll see is in the rehabilitation process, the ankle will recover, but you'll have some level of that glute dysfunction. That glute dysfunction presents itself as, um, weakness in the glute which can translate downstream from the glute and you'll see uh, injury potential happen at the knee. And you also will start to see foot placement um, variability. So in other words, if you could somehow capture a number of strides, you would start to see a, a wider variability pattern of foot placement. That may be enough to throw off the mechanics and increase injury potential. The weird part for me is about, I started figuring this out probably, or the theories came to me probably in the ballpark about 10 years ago. There's a, there's a statistic out there that states that 70% of all anterior cruciate ligament injuries or tears, if you will, are non-contact. So in other words, no one's touching this athlete, but they're collapsing under their own body weight. So I started asking these athletes, um, did you have a significant ankle sprain on the same side as, as your ACL tear prior to the tear? And I, I, I've, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now, but an incredibly high rate, yes. So it starts with an ankle sprain. It gets to glute dysfunction, and then it comes back down and presents itself as a knee injury, but it actually started. Now, why did that make sense to me? Because that's what I tore my ankle up really good, and then within a year, I'm having ACL reconstruction surgery. So it made sense to me that I had some level of dysfunction at the ankle that changed my kinetic chain, and as a result, I was more susceptible. But Anecdotally, I've talked to 100 athletes that have that have mentioned the same journey that I just did. Right. And so when we start looking at female athletes in the ACL, or if we start looking at just ACLs in general, 70% of non are non-contact. It's a really high number. No right. one's touching this individual. And that so there's something there's something else going on that needs to be considered part of the process in prehabilitation, if you will. And I believe that selfishly, I believe it is part of it is the glutes and unlocking the glutes, in my opinion. So, yeah, in, in athletics, we talked at the beginning about athletics. And um, and one of the things over the years, uh, I've, I've thought more and more, and I have sort of mixed feelings about athletics in general, because in our society, first, they're glorified, right? And everybody's really proud of their son or daughter is excelling in a given sport or winning a scholarship or is good enough to, you know, compete on a level that either professional or, you know, to, to become known. And, and we're seeing so many people hurt, though, that I sometimes wonder, and I, I agree, it teaches people teamwork and the ability to set goals and work towards them and, and all that great stuff, which obviously is very commendable. But I also see that it's often coming at a very high price in terms of really damaging people's body. And of course, many of the clients that I work with are seniors who aren't playing sports, but 
many of them have in the past. And they come in with aches and pains and things like that. And many people that I'm uh, training, one of their main goals is to maintain physical independence, functional ability for as long as they possibly can. Part of it is avoiding injuries that may come uh, based on your last few comments, it may come through no specific issue at all, just from certain weaknesses, but also there are slips and falls. So the other day when we were speaking, we were talking about the gluteator and how it could somewhat help avoid slips and falls. And you had some interesting comments that some of them agreed with what I said, but some of them were a little bit of a maybe not a contradiction, but a clarification to my thoughts about strong glutes avoiding slips and falls. So I want to go backwards just real quick before we go into the, the slips, trips, and falls, if, you, if we may. Um, sport in general, I think that it's gotten lost a little bit because I believe that, um, I believe in physical activity. And sport is probably the number one thing um, worldwide that captures people and causes them to want to participate. It's the hook, if you will. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, you know, the there's not everything is choosing my words carefully. I wish we had something in place that wasn't as um i would prefer if there was the integrity of sport to promote physical activity and there were some things that would tend to go away physical activity is being the almighty scholarship the the, the different things are are definitely impaired i i i'm on my soapbox Anything that promotes physical activity, I'm all for it because I know human movement is medicinal in general. So I, do, I, would, I would rather we have sport knowing that if you play sport, there is a risk than not having sport because I think you would have a much different society. And when you start looking at the effects of physical activity on a community or a culture, then you start to realize how valuable it actually is for long-term progression of that culture. That's what I believe. And to speak to that, it, there's, there's so much research that's there and is, is attainable and can talk about it. I just think we are better off, but I think some of our thirst for sport has been lost in the development of our children and the win at all cost and some of that stuff. I just think sometimes just going out and playing or, you know, pickup games or just going for a walk or a hike or whatever it is, right. is just as valuable, but it's most people don't get involved with physical activity until there's a nudge. And for many of us, sport is that nudge, if you right. will. Is that, is that, am I, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I just, because I, the part that bugs me is I think there's too many, there's too many children or too many adults out there ruining sports for kids. That's what I believe. Yeah. And I would really like to, to be able to promote physical activity for the ability to create a lifelong relationship with physical activity. And that usually happens early in life for most of us and then try to pre preserve it as long as we possibly can. Fair? Yeah, I, I think one of the things too, because of the, there's a certain amount, it may not seem like an inappropriate word, but segregation uh, in the sense that, you know, you're, you're in high school and that's probably the first time where you're trying out for a given team. And you either make the team or don't make the team. And of course, in a given high school, where there's a few hundred kids or a couple of thousand kids, it's a very small portion of the uh, school population that actually winds up participating in a sport in any type. And then the other kids, kind of on the tragedy that I see is they're like, well, maybe you should join the chess club, or maybe you, you know, go into theater arts and things like that. And so they wind up being not physically active, as opposed to, I think what you're saying is that we see more is a recreational 
character building fun thing and there were other outlets you know what i mean because uh, and then of course once you're right off the bat it's almost like you made the team or you didn't make the team it's kind of like you know you're it's a status thing and almost like a, a you know if you didn't make the team or you're a klutz or whatever it is uh where it, and, and that sort of in itself says, well, I'm not good at that, so I'm not going to pursue it. As opposed to, it doesn't matter if I'm good at it or not, it's fun and I like doing it. Well, it's interesting. One of the studies before I left the university that I got a chance to be involved with is we looked at, um, there are now on college campuses video on gaming team, like gaming teams. So they play certain games and there's they're competitive and they play against each other. and and the research supports being physically active to play video games and your high eye-hand coordination, your cognition, uh, your ability to process information in a shorter period of time, heightened neurological, neuromuscular systems is all well supported in this process. But it's one thing to read the research and understand that. It's a whole other thing to bring a group of people who do not want to be physically active to a exercise environment and try to coach them through that process it was it was trying it but as a result they all improved in all of the categories that they deemed necessary to be a successful gamer and so when you're looking at a traditionally sedentary population i mean some of these individuals could sit in front of a monitor for hours on end so to, to put physical activity into their life, it improved or enhanced what they were truly passionate about. Right. So it, to me, it, it, it was kind of the exclamation point to my philosophies and my theories is that physical activity is clinical. It's medicinal. It's probably more medicinal than people care to admit. Yeah. So I don't care if you're, you know, my daughter who's trying to figure sports out now, or if you're an, you know, a, a senior individual who's never been into a weight room in their life, it, come on, let's, let's participate, let's play, let's give it a try. And a lot of that is just overcoming that fear of not knowing how to do it or finding an expert who's willing to kind of walk you through the process. And so, but I mean, I've got stacks and volumes of literature over here that talk about, you know, the morbidity and mortality of exercise. I mean, that's kind of what got me involved in all the the senior side of of strength training. Well, hopefully, it'll eventually, you know, there wasn't not very long ago where golfers uh, who would have been doing strength training would have been scoffed at at best. And possibly even discouraged that their muscle boundness was going to ruin their swing. Muscle boundness, not sure if that's a word. But now, virtually all of the major golfers all have, are all very much into strength training and being as strong as they possibly can. So maybe and down I, the road, some of the gamers will figure that out as well. I believe so. And I really believe that's what, in my opinion, I had a conversation with Lori Gilstrap when Tiger Woods was still at Stanford. She was a strength coach and she said pound for pound, he was the strongest athlete she'd ever worked with. And I always just remember that because it was, he, he, I think that's what he really contributed to um, the PGA was, was preparation, the physical preparation of enhanced strength um, coordination, you know, the, the conditioning side of golf. And I think if you look at, you know, pre-Tiger, post-Tiger, he might not have been the one, but I know he was part of it. And, but you look at the athletes today that are on the PGA, many of them are physically fit and conditioned athletes, strength to body weight ratios, all really, really good. And so I agree with you. Um, uh, Diana Della Garbo out in uh, Oregon, I mean, she specializes in strength for golfers and she'll flat out tell you her philosophies. If you get a chance to put her on the podcast, I think that would be a wonderful topic. Okay. Yeah. I have a couple of uh, recently new clients who 
are avid golfers and, and that's part of their reason for being here is improving their game. So go, going back to slips and falls and old people. Fair enough. Or, or uh, <clears throat> old people, that, let me rephrase that. Mature individuals. Um, fall prevention in and of itself is a really interesting topic because the way that I look at it, and this is after a fairly extensive literature review, because clinically I wanted to make sure that when I, what I put forth would, could hold up. So I'm going to kind of give you my opinions and then we can discuss as we go along. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Let me just uh, just, if I can, maybe if you can do it a broader, so I would think fall prevention. And then the other one would be, I'm not sure what the term is minimizing. If you do have a fall, the actual harm done during the fall. And then thirdly would be if there is harm done, the recovery from the fall. So I'll, I'll just leave you with that. Um, the very first thing is, is um, fall prevention programs. If left alone as they currently state, there's many, many different ways to look at a fall prevention program. They're, they're usually very extensive. But the very first place you start is the number of prescription drugs that someone is taking. It's the very first place you start, because for many of our elderly, unfortunately, they're walking pharmacies. They're on too many pharmaceutical drugs that are having interactions. Um, my grandmother was a victim of this. She was on when I had the drug intervention done and we went and did all the investigation. She was on 13 drugs at the time and she was on three tiers of drugs. The third tier was to combat the side effects of the first of the second tier. And the second tier was to combat the side effects of the first tier. Loosely speaking, that's not 100 percent accurate. But but yeah. in my brain, as I was doing the flow chart, that's what made the most amount of sense to me. And then so that's the very first place. And then vision and and um, and. Uh, vestibular that are the next ones right you're like their your inner ear your vertigo your um your visual acuity do you have the right simple something as simple as are you wearing the right prescription glasses right. you know that's that's a large percentage of a number of the, the falls that occur but i had no control over any of those i'm not a doctor i'm not a pharmacist i'm not an optometrist i'm not that's not what i am i was a strength conditioning coach background looking at fall prevention from or fall minimization from a, a purely physical movement, a, a physical activity. So that I had to say, okay, how am I throwing my hat in this ring or what can I contribute to the opportunity, the discussion? So by and large, improving physical ability, increasing physical activity, improving physical ability or fall pre prevention programs that include some sort of physical um, uh, a physical activity, um, the number is somewhere between 18 and 23% are successful. So you're going to reduce one in five people from, you're going to reduce a, a potential fall out of five people. You're going to hit it with just one person. You might minimize that. So that's something to think about when we're doing this is that, that, that you're going to possibly decrease that opportunity by only 23 percent at most according to the statistics so but then what's really bizarre is once you actually get get into when you actually get into the numbers what's really fascinating is there's every type of physical activity you can possibly imagine is on the charts right there so they're I mean, anything you could possibly think of is is probably been investigated for fall minimization. The two things that stand out the most from what I've seen and in my opinion, one is um, movement, like a movement range of motion exercise similar to Tai Chi, where you're actually taking your center of mass and you're putting it out near the edges of your base of support, which is center of mass is kind of your balance point of your body. Your base of support is where your feet are in contact with the ground and all the surface area within. 
So if you, with Tai Chi, you're moving your center of mass out to those, to those edges. And then you're usually in a single leg stance as you transition into the next movement for, for most Tai Chi movements. That's beautiful. The only balance exercise that has ever been shown to positively correlate to minimization of fall injury amongst our elderly is single leg stance either eyes open, eyes closed on a foam or just barefooted on a solid ground, depending on the level of functionality of the particular individual. So that being the case, Tai Chi has a natural built-in balance mechanism, if you will, that is movement or what is now going to be more considered dynamic stability. But you go into in and out of those single leg stances with your center of mass out near the edge of, of the base of your support, then you're just naturally working on something that is probably more fun or more entertaining or more likely to, for you to continue to do so than just practicing single leg stance in a clinical or therapeutic environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you ask me my opinion, I'm probably considering Tai Chi as something is, is it's on my list of options of working with somebody. And then the second one that comes to that shows up and it's pretty obvious is strength training. And there's there's one statistic out there that that basically says if you're on four or more drugs, if you um, have a generalized hip weakness and you have unstable gait, you have a 100% chance of falling in the next year. Um, there's another thing that I learned from Dr. McGuff, which basically says, if you can rise from a chair without using your hands, don't put your hands on the handles, but if you can step up out of a chair, then you have about a 15% chance of falling in the next year. If you have to put your hands on the handles to stand up, then you have about a 50% chance of falling in the next year. And then the last one, that's just the one that really kind of shocked me was if you can't stand with your hands on the handle, the suggestion is to call hospice. And so that gives you some indication of the significance of lower body strength to body weight ratio to be able to stand successfully rise from a chair, if you will, without upper body assistance. And that's something that it'll, that'll never leave my brain. Like I got the opportunity at the last rec when I met you to sit with Dr. McGuff and have a brief conversation about this whole topic that you and I are talking about today. And he gave me his tidbits and his thoughts on it, as well as kind of what I was learning or knew at the time. So when you look at strength parameters, we actually did a study on campus where we took individuals that were considered elderly, which is 65 and above. The average age in our study was 78, with the oldest participant being 92. Um, they, we wanted to ask the question, what is the least amount of time spent in a weight room for benefit? That was just a, it was just a, a stupid little research question that we wanted to do. And so what we did was seven minutes of warm up takes approximately seven minutes for the average human being to break a sweat, keep the tissue up enough to where you have to perspire. And that's what we were trying to do is elevate the core temperature. So we did seven minutes of warm up. This is how we did the protocol. We did one warm up set on a leg press machine where they just got acclimated, kind of how are you feeling today? How are the joints? Once they acclimated, we had them rest until they were ready. And then we took them, the, the second set, we took them to MVF, which is momentary volitional fatigue. So where they could not do another good repetition without cheating or compromising form. And that if they got to, I want to say if they got to 15 reps, then we raised the weight. If they couldn't do 12 reps, then we lowered the weight. So we we're always in flux depending on how they're doing, what was going on and how things were taking place. And as a result of that, we increased strength by about almost 70% amongst our participants. We increased balance by over 400%. And the really cool part was 
anybody who was walking below a critical threshold of one meter per second, um, that naturally, the increased strength was naturally utilized to improve walking speed or walking velocity. Right. Now, why is that important? It goes to this, it speaks to the second part of what you asked me. If your gait speed drops below one meter per second, let me put it in perspective. It takes about 1.2 meters per second to interact with society, cross the street safely within the within the crosswalks, uh, interact with uh, sidewalks and other people in, in social gatherings. It's about 1.2 is what they figured out. So when you go below one meter per second, what happens is your fall direction starts to change. And so when you look at injury profiles, as somebody goes from their 50s into their 60s, into their 70s, into their 80s, what we start to see is there's a transition of injuries that go from wrist fractures to hip fractures. And you see this transition at the same time, gait speed is slowing down, injury profiles are changing or evolving. And that happens somewhere in the ballpark between 62 and 74 years of age. And at 74, the likelihood of a hip injury or what's called TBI, traumatic brain injury, significantly increases as you enter your 70s. Um, and a lot of that is be due to fall direction. So with, in, in, let me clarify, step back a little bit. If you have one meter per second above one meter per second and you lose your balance, your gait speed is enough to take you forward and you're going to catch with your hand and most likely fracture a wrist. When you fall at sub one meter per second, there's no there's not a guarantee you're going to go forward and the chances of a lateral or or what's called a posterior fall is basically falling almost straight down significantly increases. And as a result of that, a hip fracture becomes um, a real possibility. And then as you get into your 80s, it goes from at 65, one in every 200 falls on average will be a hip fracture at 85. So 25, 20 years later, it's one out of 10 falls. And it, it's to me, it's directly related to speed of gait. So when you we saw in our research that anyone who was walking below one meter per second naturally progressed to above one meter per second. I'm not going to lie. I was doing backflips when I looked at the, not literally, but you get where I'm going. I was excited because I'm like, we didn't work on gait patterns. We didn't teach them how to rewalk, uh, learn how to rewalk or anything. We didn't do any of that. All we did was change our strength profile and they naturally knew neuromuscularly how to use that into more confidence or faster gait speed or whatever it happened to be. It happened organically, if you will, or almost by accident. So All that, right. that, that part to me. Go ahead. So, so I don't know if you uh, knew, before I started doing this, I worked for an insurance company for 30 years. Uh -huh. And one of the products that we sold was called long-term care insurance. And the uh -huh. idea being that as an elderly person is unable to do certain activities of daily living, they can make a claim to help offset the costs of either requiring long-term care in their home or being in a long-term care facility. And part of what we would refer to as a hip break was referred to as a life-changing event. And um, I remember, I believe it was James Fisher, and in fairness to James, I don't remember whether he specified, uh, you know, James Fisher from uh, University in, in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, so I don't know what age he was referring to, but I remember the stat just blowing me away. And I'm going to misquote him. So James, if you're listening to this and correct me, but it was extremely high that within six months to a year of breaking a hip, a very high percentage, I seem to remember it was like 50% of these elderly people actually did not survive. 
So I don't, it, and again, that might have been in their, because that, that stat to me sounds incredible, but it might have been, you know, in their 80s or something or whatever. I don't know. Uh, so I don't want to miss no, no, the names, the, but, but the numbers are scary. Yeah, the, the with, with hip fracture and traumatic brain injury, TBI, um, the, the quality of life is definitely diminished. The quantity of life is probably not far behind it. And what uh, some of that, in it, it's within a year. So if you break a hip and are committed to an assisted living, um, assisted living, some of that is defeated. You're defeated. You you just you just you you just give up. You're not fighting, and I know that's part of it. Is to, it, the the body will go where the brain you know takes you, kind of thing. And so, being your everything about your life has changed overnight due to this fall, and you're now living in a circumstance that you didn't even consider the day before, type thing. I think that's a factor into the whole dynamics and that number sounds about right from what I understand but it's it is once we kind of get into the that 70 85 74 85 range from what I know but that sounds that sounds like real close to the numbers and the and the the data that I've looked at as well um but it, it's the the strengthening is the first line of defense is going to be gate speed and then the, the next line of defense is going to be protective response. So if you are strength training to minimize a fall, there's a, it's a two-step process. One is you have the, the trip or slip has occurred. You have to have the skill necessary to put your body in the right position. Some will call it power. Some will call it velocity. It just depends on how you look at it, but you have to get your body in the right position. So it's usually a very quick movement to make that happen. And then there has to be necessary strength to reverse the angular momentum, if that makes sense. And so you have to be strong enough. If you're going you know, head over heels or ass over tea kettle, then what ends up happening is your, your center of mass is outside your base of support. You have to get your foot forward out and get your center of mass back within and then be able to control or reverse that angular momentum to not let your center of mass continue to go past the base of support. So there's kind of a two prong approach when you look at minimizing injury potential if a fall is occurring one is there has to be a certain level of quickness and then there has to be a certain level of strength. And I approached it from the strength level because if I increase strength, then I'm naturally going to affect the power ability, the ability to produce power. Whereas like um, I have a really good friend of mine that I used to, a colleague of mine that's down in Florida and then the work of uh, uh, Dr. Pineapple is, is looking at fall minimization through skill development. So they actually create perturbations and then literally teach the skill of overcoming the idea of the first step, getting that foot in the right position. So they practice the, the science or art of reversing, getting the body in the right position and then working on reversing that angular momentum. It's a real fascinating because it's it's one problem looking at it from two different ends of the continuum. And I, I'm more on the strength side and then they're more on the skill development side. But my thing is, and the way I think and believe, if you don't have the strength, the skill won't be developed. The necessary yeah. skill won't be developed, in my opinion. Now, I could be wrong in some circumstances, but I think generally speaking and by, lar by and large, I think that's a I think that's the way that I, I would be hard to change my mind. Is that or, fair? Or at the very least, won't be developed optimally. Uh, sure. Absolutely. No, I agree. Absolutely agree. And that's just kind of my has always been my approach 
to development of of a skills skill strength and i can take that same argument and i can go back down into athletics and do the exact same thing i just did the skill is to minimize falls you know body position and then strength has to be there to to complete the process right but we can take that and still talk about hitting a golf ball you know i can make you stronger but if you're a horrible golfer you're just further in the woods right well, Does exactly. Make- and, 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 you know, I read something about uh, all else being equal using an athlete. You know, sometimes when I use the word athlete, I, I, I'll tell my clients, the sport you happen to be playing is called life. Right. So all else being equal, a stronger athlete is a better athlete. But all else is rarely equal. In other words, if you get somebody who's highly skilled, but not as strong, you will beat somebody who's very strong, but not very skilled, right? So strength alone will help, but skill is always, I think, gonna trump if you can do it. But like you bring up an interesting point that in some cases, lack of strength may be the limiting factor in developing that skill. So it may be uh, not an, an either or thing, it may be both in many cases. Well, and that's the thing is you as the clinician, you have to make that assessment. Does this person need, do they have the necessary strength to be able to install the skill? And compensatory or pathological movement is something that is habitually very difficult to remove. Um, It's amazing how an injury from several years ago will show up in faulty movement patterns. And the person usually doesn't even realize it. And so you're the clinician there. You have to relearn the skill and then probably you're going to have some strength issues that need to be dealt with because they've developed faulty movement patterns. That's the way I look at it. I've worked with enough people to know I feel very comfortable with what I just said. We we as human beings have a, a very developed ability to take the path of least resistance. So well, and I, I've spoken to physiotherapists and they, they talk about, um, you, so you've had a sore shoulder for a while. So as a result, or you, you injured your shoulder, as a result, you avoided certain things mm-hmm. uh, because it hurt your shoulder when you did them. And then long after the shoulder has been healed and everything's okay, or as okay as things tend to heal in the human body, you continue to avoid the things you avoided because your your brain sort of read that when you do that, it hurts, so don't do that. But then from not doing that for a long enough period of time, you wind up creating another problem, right? I think that's what you're saying, right? No, oh, absolutely. And that's where, how do you break that cycle? And in, you know, no disrespect to physio, but a lot of times they don't get enough time due to insurance reasons to be able to successfully reinstall the movement pattern or develop the strength to make that movement pattern long term. And so most likely that patient is going to become a patient again, again, fairly soon. And I I, I feel, you know, like I said, I, I think the physio world i think if you talk to most of them off the record of course but i think most of them would agree that, that sometimes they're they're limited in in what they can do because of the way our structures are currently set up um and it's a, it's a it, it's it's unfortunate and what's really sad like down here in texas um like physical education is no longer a subject at the junior college level in the state of Texas, now considered a lifestyle choice. And so we're, we're not even teaching or coaching physical movement or physical activity or strength training or some of the stuff that we're not co- teaching coaches how to coach anymore at the right. junior college level. And so I, I don't know if I'm right, but 2030 is going to be a really interesting year because we're going to have a lot of things come to head all in that same year. Um, there's going to be some some real strain on on the adult population in terms of that's when the baby boomers are all 65 plus. 
the obesity rates are projected to be over 51% um, in this country. Um, and you're just going to see a strain on the medical system that is, you know, we saw what, you know, having, I'm, this is, this might be politically not very correct, but I think that the, what the COVID um, experience really did is it exposed the, the, the medical community for being able to treat large numbers of people. I think it's a precursor of where we're headed, in my opinion, because well, I think, we're, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, as part of working with an insurance company, uh, one of the designations that I had was called CHS, which is a certified health specialist. And part of the course material essentially predicted that as baby boomers reached uh, a certain, uh, well, they're already the majority of the population, but they reached a certain age that our healthcare systems were going to be overwhelmed. I mean, which is sort of a, a, not a joke because it's not funny at all, because I think the healthcare systems are overwhelmed as they are now, mm -hmm. but they're going to be like so much greater that. You know, younger generations may well think, gee, I can't wait till these baby, boom baby boomers move through the system and eventually die because we're going to basically collapse uh, the system. And, and one of the things I remember as I was teaching, of course, one of my advisors who I was instructing said, well, well, Rick, what are you saying? You're going to let people die in the streets? I said, I hate to tell you, but that's happening now. Right, that's already happening because uh, some people simply here we have a, a, a single provider healthcare system. A lot of people think of that as such a great thing, uh, but in many cases you're hearing stories of people who are in two and three year waiting lists to have things done. Uh, so you know it sounds great and on, on paper, but in actual actuality. Uh, people are waiting a long time. They're, they're available, but get in line. So the way that I look at what you just said is that this will never be instituted, but the concept of preventative medicine, okay? And it, it's, it's, too, it's too costly. It's never because you, could, you can create a, a, a preventable medicine um, blueprint, and then you'll still end up there's an accident or the person. Does that make sense? It's it's always going to be reactive. But if 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 what the junior college system said is that physical education is a lifestyle choice. So now part of what I did was went and looked at the numbers. Approximately 23% of adults in our countries are get the minimum physical activity per the position stands of several different or medical organizations, which means they're getting 10,000 steps a day. So that's, that's usually how it's measured, right? Um, so that's 23%. Somewhere one out of four, one out of five individuals is getting the minimum recommended physical activity in a day. <sighs> Strength training is somewhere in the ballpark of six to 10%. So that's, that's our that's what we're up against i would rather someone that goes through their late 40s 50s 60s 70s 80s adopt strength training for the health of it because i think it has more good and it's safer than going for a walk in the neighborhood depending on the circumstances right and even if you do strength training as little as one day a week for 30 minutes and you love walking or hiking, then your walks and hikes are going to be more advantageous because the pace that you will be able to carry into that walk is significantly greater and therefore the metabolic demand is going to be more um, strenuous and then the result and the exercise and all that kind of falls in behind it. But I think that there's a large number of our physicians that recommend go for a walk. No, like let's take a half a step back, re-examine this opportunity. We need to get those six to 10% to literally understand the concept of 
minimal amounts of strength training done at any age has a significant benefit, especially amongst our aging population um, and being able to enhance the quality of life. Fair enough? Well, it, it's, I agree wholeheartedly. I, it, it's been suggested that one of the reasons that physicians tend to recommend walking programs is also linked to liability uh, because they'll never get sued because somebody, you know, twisted their ankle while they were out walking. But if you say do strength training, well, depending on what they do, if they walk into a CrossFit gym or, I, or, or I get do it. Some things that are, well, I would argue inappropriate for anybody, but certainly inappropriate for seniors. Um, and then they say, well, this is what my doctor recommended. Right, so they'll err, they're, they're erring too far over on the side of caution. Um, and, I, and I get what it is. And, and, and as you know, physicians, I don't think, get a whole lot of training in strength training or, or the benefits or, or whatnot. So they may be just as prone to repeating, you know, maybe if they happen to work out, they may be getting their knowledge about strength training, about the, the bodybuilder who's in the gym who's talking to them in between sets. Well, I, it's funny you mention this because I actually had this conversation last night with a young lady that's, um, she is in medical school and she is graduating in May upcoming 2022. And we got to talking about exercise and how much she was exposed to in medical school as a potential form of, of treatment. And exercise has the label of holistic now. Um, some people see it as good. Some people don't necessarily see it as good. But she and I had this conversation last night. Um, and she mentioned that they she was required to take exactly zero classes on any form of exercise in medical school. Right. And it's the, so what I've gathered, and that's not the first time I've ever had that conversation with somebody, but from what I've gathered is their knowledge is extensive of the human body. And the only way they truly understand exercise and exercise prescription is if they participate themselves right and then they have probably superior knowledge than the average strength trainer but not all doctors are versed in exercise knowledge or prescription and um i've ran up against that on more than a few times with my mom who is terminal and was being told to exercise. And if you've ever met my mother, she is, she can still run circles around most people 20 years her junior. And she's pretty beat up in comparison. She's a very physically active individual, even though that her body's failing her at the moment, but she still continues to be physically active because she refuses not to be. Um, it's just a mindset that she has and probably one that's been instilled in me as well. But um, so in the medical community, I think they need help in this particular area, but I don't know if that's ever going to be that olive branch will be extended. I think the physical therapists or physios have tried to extend that olive branch as well. And, but I don't know if how many physios actually understand concepts of prescription as well. Um, there's a study that came out recently and the numbers were not promising. So there's this, go well, ahead. My experience with physios and, and I also, I did an interview also with uh, Bryce Lee. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know that name. Mm -hmm. uh, and so where, where physiotherapists, I think, excel is if you've been in a car accident or you're recovering from surgery mm -hmm. and your goal is to uh, regain the mobility that's been compromised as a result of a traumatic event. I think that's where they really shine. 
when it comes to actually strengthening people and the principles behind getting somebody physically stronger, it just seems that, that it, their emphasis is on taking injured people and getting them back to where they were, as opposed to taking uninjured, uninjured people and helping them to get stronger in order to prevent injuries in the first place. And, and you talked about prescription. One of the things I found too is, you know, you, I, I often see these sheets that have been given to some of my clients by a physio, and they'll give a specific exercise and they'll say, uh, do this three sets of 10, for example, just as an example, but no, no reference to how much weight should be done and whether one of those sets of 10 should approach, uh, I use momentary muscular failure, which sounds like a similar concept to you said momentary voluntary, uh, uh, what was the term you used? Momentary volitional fatigue, same concept. Right, and there's no reference to that. So I always think it's kind of like a doctor giving me a bottle of pills and not telling me what the dosage is, not telling me how many I should take and at what frequency, it's very arbitrary. Well, the part that's interesting about that, that is that people, not all people, but a lot of people in physical therapy are so deconditioned that three by 10 with just body weight is often enough to create a stimulus necessary to elicit some level of change. Right. But I'm with you is there there there's part of the variables that are not being addressed are probably the most important and what's really fun is if you take what you just said and go find out where the original three by ten comes from because that story is real fascinating is is how it was initially um instituted and prescribed and and ultimately how it's been um altered sent in the last you know since 1945 the original three by ten was post-world war ii exercise prescription as the most efficient one set to 10 with 50 percent of a 10 rm second set was 75 percent of um a 10 rm and then the third set was a 10 rm to momentary volitional fatigue yeah so that's the original three by 10 that has evolved into, you know, what you just described. So if we understand we we're off the rails, then can we get this train back? You know, can we bring right. it back to where, and I agree with you hundred percent is that, and I, I differentiate that between load-based training, which is how much do you bench sarcasm and effort base, how close can you take that particular muscular tissue or exercise to your level of failure? And do we have time for recovery if we take you all the way to failure? So in other words, if I'm working with say an overhead athlete and I take them to failure and they have to pitch in two days time, I know I just set them up for failure. Right. I know for a fact, they're not gonna be able to throw that ball. They're gonna have to develop a compensatory movement to be able to throw in with any level of velocity. I know that. So I have to program accordingly, whether it's in season, off season. Right. And so, so with, with the elderly population, you know, do, can I, how close can I take this individual to that India physician and have them successfully navigate to the vehicle, drive home and be able to do activities of daily living. I don't want to put them in a position where they become a fall risk because I, I kick their backside in the weight room. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that has to be considered as one of the variables. And so I, I, I'm borrowing this and I'm fortunately, I cannot cite it right now, but I, it's one that's always in the back of my head when I program is um, maximal recovery volume. So in other words, how much volume or how much intensity can I put into your workout and how, how much time do I have for you to be recovered? So right. I'm always looking at taking a pick beyond the sesh today's session. How much time do I have to literally knock you down 
And then are you getting proper sleep? Are you getting proper hydration? Are you eating clean? Are you eating well? Because all those are going to factor into your bounce back ability or your recoverability. And that's just the way I think now. And that's moving away from load-based training and moving to effort-based training with the idea that I'm really prescribing recovery. I'm keeping one eye on recovery. Yeah, keep, keeping recovery in its proper perspective, which is at least as important as stimulus. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I have uh, a client here who is very enthusiastic and he worked very hard. And, uh, you know, as he's leaving uh, and he's worked very hard and he's about to turn 65 and he golfs regularly and he's very active. And he worked with another trainer in the past, another person who would be considered a hit trainer, if you will. And he said, well, when I left there, I could barely walk. And he says, I'm leaving here. And, and, and you know, he had a good workout, but I, I, I feel like I should do more. Let's do another set of leg presses. And I have to really say, no, nope, we're not. We're not going to do that. I says, I don't want to dig a hole so deep that you can't, you can't climb out of it. You know what I mean? You're going golfing tomorrow. And, and so we've worked hard. This is enough. Uh, you know, and, and of course that becomes art as well as science because how much is enough, how much is too much. There's always going to be, you know, paying attention to things. I always call it the mythical or magical threshold. Everyone's threshold is slightly different. It's based on how conditioned they are, how many years they've been doing this, how well they slept the night before. You know, did they did they go out? You know, did they have you know too many glasses of wine last night or what? I mean, everyone's threshold is different every single workout, and you kind of there's there's the art is you have to be able to get them at least to that threshold and push them over it. How far you go beyond that is completely up to that individual on that day but that is the art and science of of strength training as it is is you have to get them to that that elusive threshold so that they're in recovery for the purposes of adaptation and adaptation is more likely to occur if they're taking care of their body if they're hydrated nutri you know nutrients and proper sleep and we're starting to learn with these straps you know, whoop straps and the different straps that are available now, we're starting to get way more feedback um, today than we did, say, 10 years, five years ago. One of the things that you said the other day uh, that I found interesting, I just realized, geez, all of a sudden the time jumped. I thought we had lots of time. We're getting close. But I'm just going to, you mentioned when we we're talking about elderly training, you referred to elderly starting in your 40s. Yeah, it's it's not a new concept. It's it's one that's been out there, but it made sense to me because if we stop the process of developing, say, in your 30s, so in other words, there's there's a significant change when you get through your teens, your 20s, and then as you enter your 30s. But if you live a sedentary lifestyle, starting you know post college, post high school, post starting your family, whenever that sedentariness kicks in, it doesn't usually show up until you're in your 40s, probably closer to your late 40s, early 50s for the average person. And there's there are certain stages, if you will. But I believe that if you want to enhance quality of life for the longest period possible, there's a there's a certain level of strength training, a minimal level, if you will, that if you maintain that, then the effects of aging are going to be significantly less than a sedentary individual. And that's been well documented. But I, I think that the average person person should really explore what is the minimal dosage or the minimal bout of exercise that is necessary for quality of life um, for as long as possible? It's not like we turn 65 and all of a sudden, it, no, it's the lifestyle that you led for the 20, 30 years prior right. that really determines the decay or, or the opposite of that at 65 years of age. And so 
to me, that number from, if I remember right, don't quote me on this, but if I remember right, that number somewhere in that 47 to 49 years where we start to see that first significant drop in injury profiles and um, quality of life and, and injury mechanisms and, and some of the, uh, the uh, morbidity um, uh, due to disease starts to really kind of start to first present itself. Um, and that's kind of a, a very statistical way of looking at it. But to me, it was eye opening. It's like, if I really want to work with an aging population, it would be so much easier if we could somehow impress upon them earlier right. that develop the habit. So by the time they get to be an age where we're seeing these numbers and I, I I was privileged when I did research, I was privileged to DEXA scans. So I got to see people from the inside out. So I got to see bone health and tissue health. And I got to see a lot of stuff that was showing up in these scans um, because I was taught how to read them. And then I was basically taught to extract the data and be able to run all the statistical uh, uh, numbers on it for the study we were doing. And so it was real fascinating because everyone in our study for this particular study was at least 62 years of age. And the, uh, the oldest were 88 at the time. And so I got to see DEXA scans on individuals that had been physically active their entire life or completely sedentary for the last 15 to 20 years or whatever it was. And you could just see the composition. It was, it made a strong impression on me of like, huh, okay, all right, I got you. But the really cool part was it was an 18 month study. We could see pretty significant changes in that 18 months um, just by changing some of our um, um, habits, profiles. So, so in other words, the earlier you start, the better, but it's never too late. It's never too late. And that's one thing exercise has proven time and time and time again. But I think that there's, it's almost like I equate strength training in the financial industry in the same. It's, it's an investment and it's going to compound if you are diligent and, you know, you can get away with some bad decisions, you know, early in life, but eventually you have to figure out how to combine compound those habits and the dividends will pay off right down the road and it's just the way i see it and to me there's they're so closely related in terms of approach what, what i've come to uh the conclusion may be a strong word but but i believe strongly that some aspects of exercise are are over or exaggerated some benefits i should say and some other benefits are really seriously underestimated, right? So I think, for example, when you look at people, where I'm going with this is when you look at people on the cover of magazines and things like that, and, and basically being told that, you know, you too can look like this if you do this exercise program or that exercise program, or that you will never ever get sick if you're fit and all these things. I think so many of those things Unless, you know, genetics is such a strong uh, predeterminant of these things that many of those are empty promises, uh, which often, unfortunately, because when people don't get those kinds of results, then they get discouraged and, and pack it in. But other benefits such as just, you know, your bone density and, and, and everything to do with having youthful um, expression of genes and things like that and helping with your blood sugar and how it works and all these things that maybe it won't get you on the cover of a magazine, but will extend your quality of life dramatically um, are often underestimated, right? And well, I think it's kind of tragic that we're, as a result of that, people don't value, they value one more than the other, when really at the end, a lot of the first part is aesthetic and the other parts are much more important. The work of Dr. Michelle Seeger basically states that health is not enough of a reason for us to start and maintain regular exercise. That's her conclusion. 
And so it doesn't matter if it's clinical or medicinal. Um, the aesthetics is always going to drive, unfortunately, drive this business. And so I asked this question a while back and I already kind of started down this path. But, you know, if you tell me six to 10 percent of our population exercise strength train on a regular basis, my next question is how many of that six to 10 percent actually have a healthy relationship with exercise? Because we reward people for exercising, but many of our exercisers have a dysfunctional relationship with exercise. And the injuries to show for it. It's, there's, I mean, we can, whether they're physical or psychological or whatever it is, I mean, for a lot of individuals, they develop unhealthy relationships with the physical activity and continue to do something that is probably detrimental to where they're at. So my guesstimation is that probably less than 2% of our population actually has a healthy relationship with physical activity in the adult population. Now with kids, that's different, but I believe it's probably. So Richard, the part that, that scares me with that is that's our business. That's what we're in. So how do we help people develop a healthy relationship with physical activity? I want more people to move. I want that 23% to be higher. Selfishly, that's what I want. Well, once I get people moving, the next step in my mind is to minimize fall potential or injury potential and more people, more participation. Because strength is going to allow somebody, if we start in our 40s, like we discussed, it's going to get people to be better movers for longer, quality movement for longer. And that, to me, is the real objective of all of this. And that's our mission statement with Dynavec. We feel it's a valuable tool to strengthen an important link in the kinetic chain, all subsequent machines that will be released are all going to support that mission. And the idea behind it is to increase strength so that you neuromuscularly can take that strength, organize it, and, and develop movement patterns that are better or healthy or less compensatory and allow you to have a quality of life for longer. That's literally what Kent and I discussed since we first started down this path. That's our goal. That's a, that's a great, and I, I'm going to apologize because being new at podcasts, I could have maybe planned it better to not have to have an abrupt stop, but actually that's a great summary in the end. And I want to thank you, and, and I will get you to send me information, contact information, websites, I already have the website and whatnot. So when this is published, so that people know where to reach you and how to find more find out more about what you do and that great work you do. I want to thank you very much for taking the time today. It's been a pleasure as always. We always have good chats.